No? Okay. I understand that I don't look like Frankie Lyman, and with this wig and this suit on, I look more like this guy, or maybe even a black-haired Donald Trump. But I don't have any male wigs right now, and I don't have any male clothes that fit me, so I have to work with what I have. This is Ashley with Ashley Says So, back with another old Hollywood scandals video. This is about the scandalous and tragic life of Frankie Lyman. Let's get to it. Frank Joseph Lyman was born September 30th, 1942 to Jeanette and Howard Lyman. Jeanette worked as a maid and Howard as a truck driver. He had three other brothers. Their names were Howie, Timmy, and Louis. At the age of 10, Frankie got a job at a grocery store just to try to help keep his family afloat. It's sad to say, but Frankie was doing a little bit more with that grocery store money than just helping his parents out. He also started smoking marijuana at the age of 12. But by the age of 13, things really started looking up for Frankie because he had formed a group called the Teenagers with Herman Santiago, Sherman Gorns, Joe Negroni, and Jimmy Merchant. And then in 1956, Something magical happened. They came out with the number one hit called Why Do Fools Fall In Love? And the rest was history. People absolutely loved that song, including me. And I'm a new age girl. The group had a magical time. They were touring all across the country, singing to packed audiences, and this all lasted for about eight months before it completely went down the drain. Like I was saying, about eight months in, someone talked Frankie into going solo. Now, true enough, Frankie was the star of the group. Let's just be honest here. I mean, he was the Diana Ross of his group. That's just the truth. But it was not a good idea to go solo, especially the shady way that it was done. The way that Frankie Lyman left the group is quite scandalous, child. I mean, it's still hotly debated to this day, but this is how the story goes. They say the group were on tour in Europe and George Goldner, the producer, started pushing Frankie to go solo, go solo. And finally, Frankie said yes. And at that moment, George made a phone call and the record company cut a record called Goody Goody, named Frankie Lyman and the Teenagers. But the Teenagers did not sing background on Goody Goody. It was another group that did vocals for background. So how could Frankie Lyman record a solo song without the Teenagers months prior, but he didn't know anything about going solo until he was pushed to do it suddenly in Europe. Mm -mm -mm. Shiesty, shady behavior going on on Frankie's behalf. But you do have to remember that the kid is 12 years old. He doesn't know any better. It's more of the adults that are around him that are pushing him to make these decisions and they're doing it in a very, very shady and shiesty way. Check out the story of how the teenagers found out that Frankie was leaving. Our latest release, which was out in the cold again, was fine and good. You know, was doing well already. But the, the flip side on that was just Frankie singing by himself. So we made a big fuss about that. But Frankie liked the idea. And when we got back to America, he said he was going to lead the group. He was saying it in words over there, you know. But I don't know if he was the one that was behind it, you know. He was only 12, 13, you know. But what George Goldner, the producer, and Richard Barrett, the manager, didn't know was that Frankie was not in any position to go solo. They did not know that he had become hooked on hardcore drugs, heroin in particular. The way that Frankie Lyman was quoted describing how he got hooked on heroin was very sad. He said that he was 12 years old, he was still a member of the teenagers, and he got a hotel room one night with a much older lady. This was a woman from his neighborhood, a woman that he knew. Um, obviously, she was starstruck and a gold digger. I think she was probably around 27 years old. Um, took him back to a hotel room. They did whatever they did, and then she started shooting heroin. And she asked him if he wanted to try it. 
First he said no, she goaded him, come on, come on, let me just give you a skin pump. He said, what's that? She described it to him as I am about to describe it to you. A skin pop when it comes to heroin is when you get a needle full of heroin and you inject yourself right up under the skin. You don't try to find a vein, you don't try to go deep, you just lift up the skin a little bit with the needle and you inject a little bit in there. That is a skin pop. That is what she did to Frankie and he loved it. He got hooked right at that instant. And from there on, he started to skin pop more and more until that wasn't doing it for him. And then he got full blown hooked on heroin. Of course, he was still doing marijuana and also was probably doing other minor drugs. And before long, he was just a full blown addict. I mean, it was all bad. His solo career went nowhere. And on July 19th, 1957, it came to a dead halt. That's when he was featured on the Alan Freed show, The Big Beat, and Frankie caused a scandal by dancing with a teenage white girl. I mean, it was so scandalous, they pulled the plug on the show, they recorded over the episode so there would be no surviving footage, and Frankie suffered major consequences, especially career-wise. Now, around mid-1963, he did meet someone that was in his corner, and that was Elizabeth Mickey Waters. They started to date, and then in January 1964, they got married. She soon became pregnant by Frankie, and they had a baby girl named Francine. But sadly, the child died just two days after birth. After this, their relationship turned sour. Frankie couldn't really handle the death. He got back on drugs just out in the streets. I mean, he never completely stopped the drugs, but he was there at home with Mickey. He wanted to be with Mickey. But after the child died, it really just did something. It destroyed his spirit, probably feeling like nothing ever worked out in his favor. So he got back like on the streets, not at home, just on the streets, you know, staying out weeks at a time, not really coming home. So he was heavy on drugs. I don't think he dealt with that death well at all. Then sometime after that, Frankie found out that Mickey was still married to her first husband and that their marriage wasn't legal. So he had an out and he left. And he left and went to California and guess who he went to see? Miss Zola Taylor of the Platters. Look at her, ain't she fancy? Him and Miss Zola had toured together in the past and they probably always had a thing for each other, but now they were going to make it official. So they started dating and then in 1965, they went to Mexico and got married. That's what Zola says anyway. Frankie on the other hand was telling all of the rest of his girlfriends that he had that his marriage to Zola was a publicity stunt. So who's to believe? Were they really married? And was Frankie just lying to his side chicks because he didn't want to seem like a married man? Or did Miss Zola Taylor make up that Mexican marriage? After Mickey and Zola, Frankie just kind of was swaying in the wind. He didn't have anybody in his corner. Everything was going down. Uh, nothing was looking up. As I stated, nobody was in his corner and you can tell because he was approached to do a live show called Hollywood A Go Go. They wanted him to come on there and lip sync to his 1956 hit, Why Do Fools Fall In Love? The only problem is that Frankie was 12 when he recorded that song and now he's 22, 23 years old. That's ridiculous in itself to have a grown man lip syncing to a little boy's voice. The second thing is that he looked horrible. Like I said, you can tell nobody cared about him because they would have told him, no Frankie, you don't need to get on a show at this time. I mean, his face was all pockmarked. His, um, he was missing a tooth, so he was trying to sing like this to keep his lip over his tooth. Uh, it, it, at one point, it looks like he almost even has a stroke while he's singing the song. You know, I, I, I can't even barely explain it. Let me just show you a clip, okay? He really hurt to see Frankie. He was at his lowest point. Frankie was no longer the Frankie Lyman I knew. He was always a brat and egotistical and everything, but he had the voice. And he, the, 
he could back it up. But then without the voice, and he couldn't back it up. He was just another Joe. Mm. I told you it was bad. And it's really sad because this appearance did more to wreck Frankie's career than it did to help it. When people saw him looking like this, I, they just counted him out as an addict. They said he was a junkie and they were done with him. Nobody wanted to be around him. Zola and Mickey, I don't even think were claiming him at this point. It was just, as usual, going from bad to even worse. If it could get any worse. And of course it did. In 1966, Frankie was arrested on a heroin charge. And in lieu of jail time, he got drafted into the United States Army. This, however, turned out to be a good thing for Frankie. He got in the military, he got clean, and he reported to Fort Gordon, Georgia for training. It was while he was there that he went over to Augusta, Georgia, and he met his third wife, Miss Amira Eagle. Miss Amira was a school teacher, very Southern Belle, very classy lady. Not like his other two wives, you know, Zola was a superstar and Mickey Waters was a New York girl. You know, she a New York girl. I can't do a New York accent, but you guys know what I'm talking about. She was very hip and, you know, into these streets or something. I don't know. But Amira was something that Frankie needed. It was stability in his life. So he met Amira, fell head over heels, and she became his third wife in June 1967. He loved her so much that he did not want to leave her side, so he went AWOL from the military and he got a dishonorable discharge. Everything was going great for the couple. He loved his wife, she loved him, and then about seven months in, in February of 1968, Frankie started to get an itch that the South just could not scratch. So he went back up to New York to resume his music career. It's what he loved to do. You know, he had a new voice as a grown man and it actually was a beautiful voice. The public would not give him a shot. He had recorded a few songs before he came down south and they put those out. Those didn't go anywhere because they had his adult male voice. I don't care what anybody says, Frankie Lyman had a beautiful adult male voice. Sorry about that, I kind of got off track there. Anyways, he went back to New York in February of 1968 to continue with the record deal. Once he got there, he went to his grandmother's house, stayed there for a while, and he got in contact with a guy named Sam Bray. Sam Bray took him, cleaned him up, tried to turn him back into the superstar that he used to be. You know, he got his hair back with a little pompadour, slick back thing. Um, look at the pictures that I'm putting up. You know, Frankie was looking good. He was getting his pet back in his step. He was going all around the neighborhood, you know, people loving him. Frankie, Frankie, kids chasing him. Everything looking good. Sam Bray finally got him into the studio and he recorded two songs. They were I'm Sorry and Sea Breeze. You guys, Sea Breeze, it's playing right now. This is my jam. I love this song. It's a beautiful song. So Frankie knew or had a feeling that these were going to be a hit. So Frankie went back to his grandmother's apartment feeling good about the two songs he had recorded and he decided to celebrate. And it was truly the worst decision that he made in his life because he decided to celebrate with heroin. And I don't know if maybe because he had been clean for a year, so I don't know if his body just was not used to it anymore, or I don't know if he just tried to celebrate and he overdid it, but whatever the case, Frankie Lyman shot up with heroin and he died right there on the bathroom floor at his grandmother's apartment. Very sad, very tragic story. Actually, this story is probably closer to my heart than any of the other stories that I've done because it's just so sad. It's like every time he was right there, you know, it was just, just right out of the grass, just right out of grass, you know, just, just right out of grass. It's like he could never clinch on to the success that I feel that he truly deserved. Three wives had legal battles. You know, you guys can go read about that. Those are pretty scandalous, but you know, that that's not really, I didn't wanna cover that in this video. I do recommend though that you check out his life story, which it really was over-exaggerated. A lot of things did not happen, 
But go check out the movie based on his life story. It's called Why Do Fools Fall in Love? It's starring Lorenz Tate, Halle Berry, Vivica Fox, and Layla Rashawn. So some great actors and actresses in that movie. I mean, some wonderful talent. Please go check it out. Lorenz Tate was great. It's very well acted. So go watch that movie. And this is the story, the tragic, scandalous tale of Frankie Lyman. Thank you guys for watching. I hope you have a great day.